Hi, my name is Chris Oden. I'm a software engineer uh, in Johnson & Johnson, work for technology services, and I serve, uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I serve as the senior technical architect on uh, the consumer digital product line. My name is, and my oh, sorry, my name is Eric Summerfield. I am an engineering director at Phase 2 Technology. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he and him, and I am the lead technical business analyst working on the same product line that Chris does. Um, and I've been uh, working with J&J for about four years now, four or five. So we're going to talk today about BodyLess.js, which is a new uh, open source toolkit for building websites on the Jamstack. Uh, this is developed at Johnson & Johnson and released under the auspices of uh, the Open Source Working Group, which is an initiative at J&J to give back to the community. And it was, uh, it was built hand in glove with some of our partners, uh, Phase 2, which is Eric's company, EPAM Systems, and Godfrey Systems. So I want to make sure I credit our partners for the excellent work they've done on this. So I'll start out uh, with a little bit of background on the digital program at J&J &J, uh, in consumer um, and what led us to Bodyless JS. Just uh, a snapshot of the problem space. So large company. We have over 100 brands with 300 uh, regional markets around the globe, uh, leading to upwards of 800 websites in the consumer space. And kind of the, that's just consumer. Uh, J&J also has a pharma and a medical devices wing, but this is specifically the consumer website, brands like Listerine, Band-Aid, many, many brands um, that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, and the real foundational problem for us, and the one that we'll keep coming back to, is how to manage to build things that are reusable across all of our brands and all of our markets and all of our websites, while at the same time allowing those brands and those markets to differentiate. Um, Listerine doesn't want to look like Band-Aid, doesn't want to feel like Band-Aid, doesn't really want you to even know that they are part of the same company. So our current state solution, um, this was created about five or six years ago by a global digital product line, global web product line, is a single uh, Drupal 7 platform. Uh, we call it Canvas. Uh, one code base consisting of a combination of Drupal core, um, a set of curated community modules, and a fair amount of custom code as well. That is then taken by individual brands to create the lead sites for that brand. Uh, and then from that, taken by individual markets to create the actual brand websites that you would visit as a, as a member of the public. It's important to understand that it's a single code base in back and front end, not just a service layer. It has a theme and the brands and the markets take that theme and customize it to a greater or lesser extent to produce their, their websites. So that's Canvas. That's where we are now. And what some of the reasons that Canvas was created um, so first, standardization and best practices. Before Canvas, people were doing things any which way they wanted. Everybody would build their own website. Um, and so there was a huge variation in the quality of those websites and how good their SEO was, how good, whether they were accessible, um, whether they were responsive, what the UX was like. So there was a, a movement in global marketing at the time uh, this is again like five, five or six years ago, right before I came to J&J, &J, to standardize and to make sure that decisions were made and then av were available to all the brands about how, what the best in class UX and best in class uh, website architecture would be. So that was one of the promises is that you would have that out of the box with Canvas. Another promise was reusability, right? They, when everybody was building their own websites, they were all building their capabilities uh, independently of each other. So you would have six different solutions for a store locator or six different solutions for ratings and reviews. And the idea of Canvas is you would build all those capabilities once, bake them into the platform, and then uh, an individual brand or market could just turn them on. And then the last kind of uh, goal of Canvas was to, um, to, to, to drive operational efficiency with a single code base, a single set of DevOps tools, a single set of testing tools, a single set of processes, theoretically releases um, of new of iterations on the website would be faster. And also a single 
self-service content management interface would enable brands to make content changes and updates to their websites faster. Uh, unfortunately, this irresistible force came into contact with the immovable object of um, the way j, &J tends to do business. Uh, the first was that brands didn't want all to look the same. The idea was that there would be a theme which was customizable in small ways, uh, colors, typography, and such by SAS variables. But that's wasn't that didn't meet the needs of the brands. The brands really wanted to differentiate. They worked with agencies that wanted to innovate. And so they were customizing the theme and the platform in general in ways that were unsustainable, meaning that when we tried to release a new version of the platform, it would break changes that had been made on the local sites. Um, reusability led to feature bloat. So because we were building all these capabilities and baking them into the platform, the platform got huge. I think it's something like 800 modules <clears throat> now. And that meant that uh, because it was so huge, it meant that brands had to take everything, um, even though many of the features that were baked in there were only used by a handful of brands. So we ended up with a huge monolith that everybody had to accept just in order to, so that a few brands could have the features that they wanted. And of course, the size of the application also degraded the performance. And then the operational efficiency uh, came into contact with operational rigidity. Um, the fact that the code base was so huge and monolithic and that there was a single set of uh, deployment that was required for every website meant that iterations became very slow. You'd make a change in the system. It could break websites. It would break other features because they was all, it was monolithic and entangled. And so we ended up with a release cycle of something like six months, which meant brands had to wait six months for any new capability or any new feature to be developed at the platform level. Um, and also, uh, and this is gonna be a recurring theme as well, the self-service content UI didn't work out so well either, um, largely because brands almost invariably wanted website changes to involve both code and content. The line between code and content was not clear in their minds. And so we ended up baking a lot of presentational elements into the CMS to the point where it became so complicated to use that only developers could use it anyway. So we ended up doing all our content changes um, by developers. So that's kind of where we were two years ago when we started thinking about what the next generation platform would be as the Drupal end of life then loomed near. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Eric to tell you a little bit about the thought process behind the path forward. So the big prize uh, that we are trying to go after is agility, right? We really wanted to be able to develop things and get them out to the brands. Um, and get them out of the sites in a short period of time so that we could iterate on them and understand if they work and then change them and go forward. And we weren't, we weren't able to do that at all in our previous system. And there's three elements that we saw as sort of sub goals of that. Um, the first one was that we really wanted to distribute the ownership of our capabilities. So when you have the monolithic system, we had to have a team that managed that monolithic system. And so they were a bottleneck and everything had to come through them. And we wanted, we wanted to make sure that our next generation system would allow teams distributed throughout Johnson & Johnson, whether that's in the region, whether that's specific to brands, to be able to develop capabilities, uh, deploy them and seeing how they work. And then when they were successful, be able to share them with the rest of the other teams. Um, which leads into our second part. We really did want to maximize reuse while still allowing this differentiation. So uh, Chris didn't talk on it, but the, the period before Canvas was called the Wild West. Um, and it was called that because yeah, everybody was doing their own thing and they were differentiated a lot, but we couldn't reuse anything. So we didn't wanna go back to that space, right? We do wanna allow the brands to differentiate. We want them to be able to make their own system and be different. But when 90% of the things that they're doing the same, we still wanna capture that part and reuse it. Even though the flashy 10%, we wanna allow them to change. So we wanted a system that's gonna let us dive into that problem and still do lots of reuse. And then third, we wanted a system that we could streamline the workflow uh, and how we get editors to do work and how we get uh, um, supporting staff to help them do that work. So to address these three goals, we have sort of three principles that we drove after. 
The first one is vertical decoupling. So this is a term uh, coined by Martin Fowler. Um, and it's generally the idea that what we want to do is we want to separate not the concerns of like uh, the back end from the front end, but the different pieces in a vertical manner. We're OK with there being coupling from the component, the micro component, uh, micro front end to a micro service back end. Right? What we don't want to have is those things be dependent on the things next to them. Um, so this vertical decoupling is going to allow our teams to own maybe end to end the, the capability, but allow those capabilities to be broken up against multiple teams. So this is one of the key pieces that we wanted to, uh, to uh, what's the word I'm looking for now, uh, that we wanted to implement so that we could reach that goal. For meeting the goal of maximizing reuse and enabling differentiation, uh, we really wanted to build on a composite, a composition model. So we wanted to find ways to stack functionality instead of, um, instead of sort of having lots of pieces, we wanted to find ways to take these guys and put them together in you unique and interesting ways. We're going to talk about this a lot more, so I won't go into too much, but we really wanted to have this composition space and for streamlining the workflow. Uh, we do definitely have this issue where a brand would say, I want to change the website. They didn't say, oh, I want to change the content, right? Oh, I want to change the styling. And so the way that we wanted to move forward on this is instead of having these different workflows and trying to have this arbitrary line between what's supposed to be content and what's supposed to be code, um, to just bring them all together. And so we want the content to be in the code. And we're going to dive more into this as well. So we wanted to bring the content in the code. And then in doing that, we wanted to make a very simplified UX so the content editors could work with it and not have to have massive training and understanding how the system works. And then the hard things, the things that were outside of their reach, we wanted to make it so it was very easy for developers to collaborate with them and get those things done. So you'll see our move here is away from trying to uh, separate developers and content people and uh, and more towards trying to bring them together and make things go quickly when they're working together. So the overall architecture of the system at J&J, it's, it's pretty standard, uh, the GM stack setup. So we have a whole bunch of different libraries. Um, like I said, we expect different teams to maintain these different ones. So there'll be local libraries, there'll be different brand libraries. There'll probably be a global library that has lots of our main things in it. Um, and all of those we're using React to manage the components. And we're using NPM to organize those libraries and bring them together. So all of that work is then going to get pulled into the care system. So we're combining those components um, and we're providing ways to edit uh, those components with code, but also we'll show here with, with a content UI. Um, and then we're using Gatsby to create flat and static versions of those sites, um, which we are going to then deploy. Uh, then we're going to use a service layer. And mostly our service layer here is actually third-party integrations, but there is some Lambda services that we're using as well um, to sort of add the interactability back to the website. So the, and then the last piece, I'm sorry, is, is that we do see, um, not at the immediate sense, but definitely in the near future and in the far future, that there's going to be a content as a service where we're going to have content that is actually devoid of the channel that it's being presented in that we're going to want to have to feed into the system. And this was another reason for going to the GM stack is that while we're building the system that doesn't require this, and we're going to talk more about that, it's ready to take in that content in the future. Um, so that's the main piece here. And as we were building out, you'll hear like, you know, we found things that solve some of these problems. We found React to do our component stuff. We found Git, and we're using Bitbucket to do our workflow um, parts of the components. But there was big areas that we didn't have the tooling that we needed. And that's what got built into Bodyless.js. Uh, and the first one of that is, is what I alluded to earlier, is this composite system. We needed a design system that would facilitate this reuse and extensioning. Um, and uh, we're going to dive into that more. But that was a big area of like, we don't have this. this. This isn't something that we have. We need to find something to help us do this. And then the second one was the moving the content to code. How do we make this interface? Um, and how do we make it so that that workflow is smooth? Um, and we're going to dive more into that one as well. And that's the second part of really what became bodyless. So that first thing, let's dive into it now. Uh, it's the bodyless design system. Um, and when we started off in this, we knew that we were going to use component-based design. So we bought in. We were full Kool-Aid drinkers of atomic design. 
maybe not with exactly the right names, but this, we were brought into the concept here. We really wanted to make sure our things were reusable. We wanted to make sure our components were encapsulated um, so that they didn't interfere with each other. And we wanted to make sure they were independent because we saw people wanting to switch them out a lot, right? So we were definitely, we want component-based design. But when we started to dig into this and we're thinking once again, we have 800 sites that are eventually gonna be using the system, right? With lots of different design choices, lots of different regions with using different uh, backend pieces. And when we go to build in this way, we reached the, this fork in the road where there was two ways to go. Uh, Chris, can you go? Thank you. <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> so um, the first one is we start building components and then we need to do something a little bit different with that component. So you build it inside of the component and you expose some new props on it that make it so you can do uh, that extra piece. But if you keep on doing this, those components just grow and grow and grow. And, and I, I've seen this a lot with some of our other Jamstack clients, right? Where we start to build these things out. And even when they have just one site, <laughs> you get these monolithic complicated components because you're adding in all this variation. And we were thinking, well, if we're going to do this with 800 sites, those things are gonna be completely unmanageable. So we don't wanna go that direction. And then the other direction is of course, well, if I have something that's slightly different, I can always just fork the component and I'll add in my piece there. Um, and we saw this going the same problem, right? We would just get all these forks and we were going back into the wild west and they wouldn't be shareable. I, I, would, I might want three of those things and I have to like fork and make a new one that had all three of those. So we wanted to find a path where we didn't have to make this choice where we could build things up um, uh, that didn't require us to choose monolith or forking. And while we were doing this work, Chris was doing a lot of research into the design space and the use of design tokens. Uh, also at phase two that we're pushing in this direction. Here is, oh yeah, look, they're doing this in the design world. They, they, they bought into the components that we have this system. We're gonna build up components inside of components, but there's this other thing that's really important that are these things that aren't a, a component. They're not a thing, they're a verb. There's something I'm going to apply to something else. Um, and they call them design tokens. And this is another great level of reuse. Now in the design space, this is usually mostly topography, colors, um, uh, sizing, those type of things. And they could take those and go, oh yes, that is supposed to be a primary color or that is supposed to be our standard padding. Um, and then you can apply these tokens and the beauty about it is that you can stack them. And that's where we really were like, oh, this is where it's going to get us where we need to be. Because it's, it's, I can't stack components on top of each other that are trying to do the same thing. But if I have tokens, I can stack as many as them I need on a component and have it transform to the component that I needed. The other piece that we saw here is that React has a great corollary to this in their um, idea of higher order components. So these are, these are functions that take in a component, do something to it, and give you back a new one. And you can pass something through a whole series of HOCs and you'll get a component out at the end that does all the things. And that's exactly what we were wanting with the design tokens. So our first step on this was to do this at the element level. Um, and we are using uh, Tailwind in our system for, uh, what's the, we, there's this way that was described as Tailwind is giving us the options uh, of, the, of the options that we have. And then our tokens here are making are showing the decisions that we make. So we're using Tailwind to define all the options that somebody can do. And then we're using tokens to say, this is what I want to be a header, or this is what I want to be a CTA. Now I wanna call out, um, and then Tailwind, I don't wanna go into it too much, and it's not that important here. Like we could have been using CSS in a, a JS, or we could have been using CSS modules here. In all of those things, you can make these HOCs that I'm then going to apply to a component um, to do something to them. And in this example, I'm using the at CTA in two different locations, right? In the how to deal with a diaper rash and in the original formula one. And I've stacked them in different places with different other HOCs. So in the first example, it's stacked with an HOC that makes a round bordered button like object. In the second one, it's stacked with something that makes it so that it has a yellow background. Um, but the piece that I get to reuse is the CTA. And this is where I get to go to that 90-10 that, uh, that rule, right, that we were talking about earlier. Oh, the thing that's shared everywhere is the, the styling around the text. The thing that's different is the styling um, around the, the, the div that it's in. We can separate those out. 
Now this works really well at the element level and we had a lot of success with that, but this doesn't solve the problem of how do I do this with a large component, right? I don't want the only shareable thing to be elements. I wanna be able to have something that's larger that I can also share around. And so because we were using HOCs, we were like, oh, well, we can apply HOCs to larger elements as well. Um, and so here's an example of how we started to build out our components to enable this tokenizing of large components. So this is a tout. Um, some people call it a card. I'm sure there are lots of other names. It was called a taco for a while, j, &J. It's a call, right? It has an image, it has uh, a title, it has a little blurb, and it has a call to action. Um, and the way we built out our component here is to just set up the skeleton for this. Instead of doing the work inside the component, we were just laying the API for what the component is. So you'll, you know, I don't want to go too much into the, the depth around this, but you'll see in the return there, we're just taking, we're taking a whole bunch of components and we're placing them and stacking them. And then at the end here, you'll see we pass it to this designable function. And what that function is doing is saying, okay, instead of taking these components, I'm going to let you pass me an, uh, a whole bunch of HOCs and I will apply them to this component. And so now, instead of having tokens that just apply to an element, I can have tokens that apply to uh, a large component, like this one, a, a molecule or organism, if you will. So go ahead, Chris. So this is, a, this is one that makes a tout become horizontal. So you'll see I'm, I'm using the add class function here too, right? I'm adding in a whole bunch of classes. I have to touch a whole different pieces, but it just shifts it to make it horizontal. Um, in this case, it's doing it so that at a, it's in a responsive way as well. But it's pretty straightforward, right? But you can see here I have, I'm with design, takes in a whole, a, a, a keyed set of HOC. Um, now, when I pass this on top of a component, it'll add those items to that component. So I pull in out the functionality, right? The decision making out of the component and put it in a different thing that I can reuse, the token. So there's another token. This is the styling token we'll show here. Um, and this one's uh, the default styling token for our test site. Um, and you'll see it's actually using uh, HOCs uh, that were tokens as well. So it's saying use the as text color primary for the wrapper, use the image round for the image. And you can tell here now in my examples on the right, you'll see the first one, the horizontal one, that's a tout that's had two tokens applied to it. It's had the horizontal one applied to it and the styling one applied to it. And then the token over one is just the tout with just the styling applied to it. So this is a very simple example of where I can start stacking my tokens. Um, but this stacking can go on and on and on and on. And in fact, in our test site, if you, if you go take a look at it, you'll see we have um inside of the content selector the content selector uh you can choose i think probably somewhere from about 60 different touts and those are composed of about seven tokens right that we just reuse in different ways to make all of those components and if i need to do something different and we'll show in the future it's really easy to just get the tokens that i want to share and add new ones that i needed so this is how that design system got us to the point where we'll be able to have all these brands reuse as much as we can, but yet still give them the flexibility to change the pieces they don't want. So I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna pack it back to Chris to start talking about the edit system where we tried to solve the second problem. Right, so um, remember there were two things that we said we were missing at the time that we started. One of them was this pattern for composition of, des of design systems and the other was, um, a tool set for managing uh, content in code. Um, since since we began, I think more progress has been made in that space elsewhere. Uh, Tina CMS was released recently, which uh, tries to solve the same problem and Netlify CMS is also in that space. Um, but those were not mature or didn't exist when we started. And we uh, also, there are some ways about some things about the way we're doing it, which I think distinguish us a little bit in that space. Um, so I'll start out talking about why we wanted content in code. Um, and uh, we've mentioned this before, and I'll say it again. Um, there's a, a, a kind of a myth that a CMS enables you to separate content uh, and code or content and presentation. Um, uh, and that 
when you do that, it makes it much easier to update your website quickly. What we found at J&J is that, as we've said, marketers don't think that way. They don't think of content and presentation separately. And that, in fact, most CMSs manage a significant portion of presentation as content. There are layout builders and CMSs. There are tools that allow you to um, configure colors and select fonts. There are um, WYSIWYG editors. There's lots of aspects of presentation that are managed as content in a CMS so that even web CMSs tend not to separate content and presentation. And the result of this is that web CMSs tend to end up with very complex um, or can end up with very complex edit interfaces. And this was definitely true of Canvas. Um, and especially where you start trying to make changes that, uh, that alter both um, code and content, you either have an extremely complex edit interface, which a develop you need a developer to use. And I remember having a conversation about this for those of you who are familiar with Cohesion DX, which is an extreme example of managing presentation in the CMS, um, uh, which is a product, it's an Acquia product, that the skill set required to use the advanced features of that UI is really a developer skill set, and you need a developer to do it. And we thought, um, well, if you're going to need a developer anyway, then maybe the complicated things should be done by a developer using the tools that a developer likes, like IDEs, um, rather than forcing them to point and click their way through a, a UI. Um, and I remember this was my first experience with Drupal, um, things that I was used to do by writing code. Now I had to click my way through the Drupal admin UI, and it was always a very frustrating experience. Um, so the, the complexity of the edit UI, and then the, the, even, even with a very complex UI, that, such as we had in Canvas, there were still many changes that required um, actual developers to write code to go along with the change in the content because you couldn't think of every possible thing that the brand might want to do and bake it into the CMS. So you ended up with two workflows, right? One workflow for the code and one workflow for the content. The work, the code would be deployed to a staging server. You would have to make content changes on that staging server to see what the content and code together would look like. And then somehow when you deployed the code to production, you would then have to get the production content changes made. And there are solutions for this in, in the Drupal world. Deploy module comes to mind, but they um, they all have limitations and are quite complex to implement uh, if you have complexly structured content. Um, in distinction to that, if you make your content into code, then you only have one workflow. Everything goes together. All the changes go together. And in fact, you can then do them in isolation on separate branches. This is all... Um, basic Jamstack stuff, right? Because there are really two Jamstack paradigms that are common in the world. There's the headless model, right? Where you have uh, the code changes made uh, in an editor and the content changes made in a CMS. Um, and then you have a CD, a build system that brings them together, generates the static site um, and deploys it to a server or a CDN. But equally common in the world is, the is what we call the bodyless model where the content is managed alongside the code as uh, JSON files or markdown files. This is, this is typical in a lot of the Jamstack blog um, examples that are out there, right? And everything is managed as code and it all goes out together on the same branch. And then when you, when you, you have a CI that responds to pushes to that branch and rebuilds your website. So this is great. And this gets all the advantages of the single workflow um, that we were looking at but it kind of leaves the content editor out of the picture because the content editor is probably not gonna feel comfortable using an IDE or an editor to make the changes to the parts of the website that they can change. So we thought, well, what if you create a UI for the content editor that is simple enough and intuitive enough that they can make changes to the code base? And that's really what Bodyless is, is or this part of Bodyless. It's a way for content editors to edit the code, edit the part of the code that they are capable of editing, which in this case is the, the JSON files that make up the content. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric again to give a quick demo of that edit UI. So this is a uh, example site that this is actually a, a real brand, it's Pennington Canada. Um, and we've rebuilt it in the, uh, in the bodyless system. Um, so we're at the homepage here and I just want to point out what we're doing here is running Gatsby Develop. 
So like Chris said, we're just making a new UI to the codes using the, the Gatsby system to do that. So we're running that, and uh, you still, I get this bar on the left, and I'm just on the home page. While I'm in this mode, before I, I can interact with the page. So all these links are active. Um, and let's go ahead and go off to this link. Um, and so now I'm on the next page, and I'm going to go ahead and enter into edit mode. So when I've entered into edit mode, now instead of these things being things that I can interact with to follow the links and that stuff, man, it is going slow, of course, when we have a demo, isn't it? All right, there we go. Um, now this is the editable system. And keep in mind, like I said, we wanted to make it so that the content person didn't have to have sort of advanced training to be able to do this. So we've tried to make it as much as one big WYSIWYG as we can. So this top thing is an image. If I click on it, I can get the button to change the image. Um, Come down here. This is a set of text. If I want to highlight something, I can change the styling on it. Um, and and I'll and I can flow down here. We get down to the bottom here. I have these three touts. Um, you know, I can resize them. Let's take this one down to a third. Let's do a third, a third. You're a half. So hold on a second. Um, there we go. Um, so I can resize them. I can also reorder them. Um, grab this one. So these are things that are pretty straightforward, right? We tried to make sure that the, 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 like in this case, we didn't want to put things in here where you can put in containers that are 50% or 100%. Like these layers and layers of complexity that often happen in the layout. Not that that might not be needed. And we tried to get as far as we could with this very simple, you can resize, you can move things around. But if we do need that harder stuff, we'll talk to a developer about it. Um, so one thing else I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a little content entry, but I'm going to create a new page first. So this is in the article section. Um, so when I create this new page, um, do that. Oh, I did that page already. So. All right. Um, so, page, and because it's in the article section, it's using a template. And this is another power of using, uh, you know, Gatsby. Is I just have these different page templates. Um, this one happens to say there's an image, then an area to do content. Um, so let's first of all do our image here. Let's change this out. And, um, and then I'm going to add into my body area here. I have this whole set of components. And this is where I was telling you, you can get lots of different types of components. We have pouts, we have lists. I just want to do a rich text editor. So I'll do this one. Um, and then I'll paste in some stuff that I had. That's not the right one. Um, that's what I wanted. Um, and then this first thing. I'll make that a header, um, and I'm going to make content in bold. Um, now I want to do a list after this, so I'm going to add in another item. And I'll go to my list. I'm going to pick my bulleted list um, and type in here. Uh, try. And then I'm going to add another item, and I'll type in there. Keep clean. And then I might go, oh, you know what? I didn't actually want this to be a bulleted list. I wanted it to be a more fancy list. So I'm going to swap out this component for a different list um, that lets me have images. So my content stays there. And now I can change this out and I'll add my images. Um, the first one, try. Um, and my second one. And now every time I'm doing this, what's happening in the background is just data is getting written to files in my code base, getting written to JSON files, right? Every one of these actions, every time I did something, it wrote something to the JSON file. So I'm just writing code, basically, by going through this editor base. And to that end, when I'm done, I can come over here to push, and I can put in my message. 
And what I'm doing is putting in a commit message. And when I click checkbox here, it would take all those changes. It would commit them to the Git repo on the branch that I'm on, and it would push it to the origin. Right, so it's all just another interface to our Git, our Git um, system. Um, and you know, if I look in our history here, I'm seeing all the commits that have been made previously. Um, so that's just a taste of the edit interface, right? Um, and I'll hand it back to Chris to talk more about the component space. But we just want to give you a, a little taste into what it looks like. Sure. Yeah. So I think the key key thing there, right, is that interface is just a way of editing JSON files. It's a way of editing JSON files that content editors can use, and that is that is WYSIWYG. Um, and what makes it work, right? Every one of those components on that page uh, has its own JSON file, and this is what we mean by components owning the model. And this is kind of the fundamental uh, principle behind the way the bodyless edit system is structured. So uh, let's look at this from in comparison to typical headless. CMS system, right? In a in a headless system, you have a back end, and in the back end, there is uh, some kind of a data model which defines the structure of your content and the information architecture, right? And then on the front end, uh, if you're doing component based design, you have a set of components that can render, that are capable of rendering that content, uh, serving it up as a view to uh, to site visitors. And then in between them, you have a controller or a view model which manages the negotiation between the needs of the view. The, the content that the view can render and the content that's structured in the back end. So you have these three pieces, very standard architecture for, um, for data modeling, right? In Bodyless, we, we kind of flip it around, right? We start on the front end, we say, okay, because again, content and presentation tend to be linked, we say, this is what we want our website to look like, our web page. And these are the components. Again, we use component-based design. So these are the components that it is composed of. But then we say, each component has certain specific data needs for that it needs to render. So it defines a model, and the model in this case is a JSON file or a collection of JSON files that contain the content that is rendered by the component. And generally, the schema of those JSON files exactly matches the prop schema of the component. Not always, but in, in many cases, that's the way it works. And then um, optionally, if you want data to come from a microservice backend, you can have a microservice with an API that is also coupled to the component. This is, again, that kind of micro front end or vertical decoupling idea, where um, that data model that is owned by that component is independent of the data model that might be owned by other components on the front end. So what this enables us to do is manage everything from the front end, which is where you're actually constructing the web page. Um, and I'll show you a quick example to, to close out of how this makes uh, making a very typical and seemingly simple website change um, much, much simpler. So this is an actual, this is an actual uh, piece of the penitent site that uh, Eric demoed. And the change here is to take uh, a bulleted list that you have on the left and convert it to a list where the bullets are replaced with infographics. So if you look at the way this might be done in a typical headless model, right? First thing you would need to do is model the data that you wanna represent in the back backend. Um, uh, this is if you were going to do it with structured data, you also might just make that a WYSIWYG text field and have unstructured content in there, um, which would make this task even harder. But we'll give them the benefit of the doubt here and say, yes, they actually are using structured content on the back end. They have um, a list block with a title, and then that list block has a collection of items, each of which is represented by um, a field entity, say, in Drupal. Um, so then you need somehow to expose that to the front end. So you create an API. There are out-of-the-box tools in many CMSs that will let you do this, but the more you use the out-of-the-box tools, the more likely it is that your API is gonna be coupled to your data model, and so your API will change when uh, we change the data model, which is not always a good thing. So um, part of this controller might be to manipulate that data into a consistent API. Um, and you're also gonna need a piece on the front end that can consume that API and, so, and, and pass it on to the components that render it. If you're using Gatsby, you might use uh, GraphQL queries for that. And then finally, you have a piece on the front end that does the rendering. It's relatively simple front end code, just a couple of React components, a list component, and then another component that, uh, that renders the items in that list. So now, what if we wanna change that bulleted list to this? 
Well, you started on the front end with relatively simple front end changes. You would change the um, item that was rendered in the list to now a compound item rather than just rendering a single list element. Um, but now that new component that you've built needs to get its data from somewhere. It needs to get its image from somewhere. So you have to change the model on the back end. You might, you're probably using that text field somewhere. So you don't want to change that. So you create a new text image field and you change the type of the items in the list block to point to the text image field, right? So you've now made a change to the, to the schema, to the data model. And then you have to update your controller to, uh, to deal with that. And one thing to point out here is you've now made a change to your API. So if you have other clients that are consuming this API, they might break. Now, in this case, you're just adding a field, but if your other clients are expecting data of a particular type, um, the mobile apps often use strongly typed languages, they could well break because of this API change. So in order to make this relatively simple change, converting the, um, the bullets to, to images, you've had to touch code in four different places in two different applications, the backend application and the front end application. You have to coordinate the deployment among those. You have to make sure they can be tested uh, independently and together. You might have to mock out the API in order to make your front end tests pass. So there's, there's a significant amount of work involved in this. Now, if you look at doing it from the body list perspective, here's the front end code uh, that you start with. You see it's, it's really not much more complicated than the front end code we had for the headless example. You have a, we're, we're using some built-in body list components, the list, um, the as editable HOCs. Um, we're using the design, body list design API to tell the list what it should render for each item and so on. Um, so now, what, just by writing that front end code, you don't have to do anything else in order to get your model because just running the editor, you will be now be able to edit those um, components uh, and each one of them will generate its JSON file. And this is, this is I think, uh, a, a differentiator for BodyList that if you want to make it from uh, other tools in the same vein, that if you want to make an editable page, you don't create a page and then find all the places in the page where you want things to be editable and then create a form that provides data to them, which is kind of a non-vertically decoupled way of managing the data. Um, instead, you each of these components manages its own little piece of data and knows how to edit it, and you just compose those components into your page. Um, so now, if you want to change to this, what do you have to do in BodyList? Well, you have to make some changes on the front end that are very similar to the changes you made in the headless model. You have to replace the list item with a compound component. Um, and then the next thing you have to do is nothing. That's it. That's all you have to do. Because once you've done that, then automatically the body list system now is generating data, a data model for the new component that you've added. Hey. So the change hey. that in the headless, yeah. So just to point out your, your typo came back. Yeah. That that's supposed to be a URL, uh, the data point there shouldn't be text. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, yes, yes, uh, yes. That should be that should be a source. Yes, that should be a source. Yeah, but just right. Yeah. This should be a source with a URL. Sorry. Our, our version control of the PowerPoint failed us. Exactly. <laughs> um, so just to close out, the changes that uh, to to accomplish this in the headless model, you had to touch a lot of different things in a lot of different places. And here it's what, it's like eight lines of code uh, on the front end in a single place that can be deployed simply to the website. So that's uh, the final example. And I guess at this point, I will open it up for questions or comments or any feedback that anyone would like to have. It looks like we have a little bit of time. Yes, we do have quite a few questions. I'm gonna start with the uh, first come first serve. So I'm gonna read off the first question. From Chip Moza, uh, he asked, how would you edit SEO information for a single page? It's That's a great question. So the way, we are doing that. So we use React Helmet to, you're talking about meta tags, I assume, and that sort of thing. Uh, we use React Helmet to, to manage the header. And we've basically built higher order components that you can apply to Helmet that allow it to have editable meta tags. And each one of those stores its data as a JSON file uh, at the site level or at the page level, depending on whether it's site level or page level data. And that's a, it's a good 
so we we maintain two collections of JSON files. One of them is uh, content that is specific to the particular page, and another one is site-wide content. So that if you have a header, for example, that has always the same content in it, you can edit that content in, once, and it'll apply to all pages. But for the SEO stuff, yeah, it, even though it's not visible on the page, there's we have a. a a button that shows up on the left-hand side that brings up a form like that image upload form. We don't actually have uh, that. that Eric we don't have that button yet. Um, no. We don't have it yet. Oh. It's being developed right. It's being developed right now. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I just did. I just did the pull request review on it. So <laughs> it's, um, it's almost there. In the in the code right now, we have the whole the whole part that pulls from the JSON files. We don't have the button yet, but that's like in the sprint. Uh, second question. This is from Shane Thomas. He, Shane Thomas, yes. Did you consider using MDX and Markdown files instead of JSON files for storing the content? I can. We did I, consider. It. Eric, you want to take that because yeah. I think you have a strong opinion about that. <laughs> I do. Yeah. So we did consider that, and uh, it's interesting. At Phase Two, we have a lot of different projects that are experimenting with doing different Jamstack stuff. And um, one of the conclusions we reached, they're all starting to reach now, which I go and look at all their Markdown files, because a lot of them are using Markdown files for their backend. And their Markdown files are a big chunk of stuff in the head, and then no Markdown. Um, and that sort of, we saw that pattern a lot, that the data we wanted to store structured and didn't match the structure of Markdown. Um, and so when systems were doing that, and they were doing things that were really tight, like we wanted a lot more control over the components, then you end up not using the markdown part of those files. And so we sort of forgo that and said, let's just use JSON files instead of uh, you know, the head part of a markdown file. Yeah, um, and also I'll say we're using the slate editor as our rich text as uh, mm -hmm. as our rich text framework. And the slate editor stores its natively stores its content in, in JSON as a structured document. Um, so rather than figure out, should we then take that document and worry about serializing it and deserializing from Markdown to store the data? We decided, well, since we're using this editor and it already has a native data format, let's just use the native data format for the editor. Uh, a question from Kevin Cooper. Is there an integration with, for example, GitHub for authentication, or do you need to run the editor application on a service somewhere? Yeah, so that's a great um, question. You do not need to run it on a server. You can run it locally and it'll just use whatever local authentication mechanism. It's it's really just, if you run it locally, then it is just making Git, it's it's just using the uh, Git to, to, to do the Git operation. So it'll use whatever authentication mechanism you would normally use when you are authenticating with GitHub. Um, we do want to run it on us in the cloud because we don't want to deal with maintaining content editors, local development environments. Um, so what we're doing for authentication in the cloud is we have an integration, a custom integration that we built with uh, Johnson & Johnson's uh, identity management systems. So we have a authentication middleware that we add to Gatsby develop that, um, that forces you to authenticate using j, &J AD. Uh, a question for Matt Glamen. Are folks able to contribute packages of custom components for bodyless, uh, that is, widgets to embed decouple triple commerce products uh, slash add to cart? Uh, absolutely. We welcome contributions. I think, you know, something like that would not be probably part of bodyless core, but you could create your own packages that depend on bodyless and um, then use the use those components. Uh, question from Dan Lennon. Uh, sorry, I would, I would just say to, to add to that, that um, what, what, if you wanted to do that, I think the key thing would be to build the components in a bodiless manner, because we're, we're a little bit opinionated about how components should be built in order to enable them to be styled and composed properly. So you could build almost any component oh. that, go ahead. So I, I think that is true, although I'll give an example. Um, the, the menu that we use is RC menu. Um, and I forget the name of the pattern. Chris, what's the pattern that they use? Um, I'll just describe the pattern since I don't remember the name. But you know, they, they use a pattern where they have components that they expect to live inside of other components. And a model like that was really easy for us to turn into bodyless components because right. each one of the elements right, was a single component that we could then replace in our system. Right. Yep. But you, you could create a 
component that was editable using the bodyless edit system without mm -hmm. adhering to our compositional patterns too. That's a possibility. Uh, question from Dan Lemon. Does the admin editor offer any type of restrictions such as user editor as to respect the CI CD of the page? For example, width of image blocks cannot be any pixel size, but must be a specific step value, one third, one half of one sixth. So things always line up across the whole page. So, uh, yeah, well, I think I understand. So at first I thought you were asking about roles and permissions, like different uh, editors, different edit editor roles can do different things. Um, and we do not have that built at the moment because we don't really have the notion of user roles. Um, and because we imagine that the publishing workflow, which is where you would mostly want those roles, you know, restricting who can, who can deploy to production, will be managed in a different system. We don't actually have, so when Eric pushed his commit uh, in his demo, he was pushing to a feature branch and the control of when that actually went to production would be managed by merging that feature branch to the master branch. And that would be handled in GitHub or in Bitbucket or whatever, whatever Git system you're using. So you'd use the, uh, the roles and permissions there to control who could do it. Um, it is something that we have considered to add roles and permissions, um, but we are waiting to find out what those roles actually might be at J&J, because <laughs> on Canvas, which is built on Drupal, which has many, many, many different roles and permissions, everybody is just an administrator in the real world. They don't actually use the roles and permissions on Canvas. We spent a lot of time using um, wonderful roles and permissions, and then no one used it. And, work, and wonderful workflow, and then nobody used it. Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of restrictions on like the kind of content, image widths, things like that, those are completely up to the site builder, right? You can control, uh, you can build validation into you. Our image uploader right now has no validation built into it. It's pretty rudimentary. We're in the process of iterating on it to integrate it more fully with the Gatsby image capabilities so that we can generate thumbnails on the fly and stuff like that. Um, and as as part of that effort, we. I think we do do validation on the file type that you can upload, but I don't think we do any image width validation. But um, but as for the blocks, the the block sizing. So um, in my demo, I move. Sorry, y'all, um, and resize them. That actually, is also a setting inside of the component that you place in the page. What those options? And how many of them there are? So you could create a a, a block placement. We call it a flow container. You could create a flow container that only accepted full width objects if you wanted, so that you made sure that everything was a single, um, single slice on the page. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question to see how long this is going to go. Uh, from uh, Fernanda Alini, did you migrate uh, the content that was on Drupal? If yes, how it was done? Um, so we have not actually deployed any sites to production on this um, technology. The site that we built, the Penitent site, we did a parallel site build with the Drupal site build. So um, I believe most of the content was migrated either directly from the copy deck or um, cut and paste from Drupal. We haven't really looked into automated content migration from Drupal yet. Our Drupal content is... Um, very structured. Uh, we use, well, in some places it's very structured and in some places no. it's not. It's kind of split. When Drupal, when we when we first, when Canvas was first developed, um, they used panels and panelizer a lot. So we have a lot of unstructured content that is all just totally bound to the presentation, but in lots of little different pieces. And then there was a switch about halfway through to using paragraphs instead. And so that content is all highly structured. Both present unique challenges for migration. Okay, I think I'm just going to, this is going to be our last question uh, of the session from Kevin Cooper. Are binary files committed to the Git repo or kept elsewhere? So at the moment they're committed to the Git repo. We have looked into alternatives to that. Um, it's the binary files are primarily the images. Um, so they are currently committed. We've looked into a couple alternatives. One of them is uh, Git LFS. Uh, we haven't implemented that yet because it's still not 100% clear to us what the DAM integration will be for this going forward. There is work underway in j, &J right now on a 
digital asset management system for a consumer. And it's very possible that all the images will live there and that our image uploader won't be an uploader anymore. It'll just be a selector to pull images from the dam, in which case they would not be committed to the repo. But for now, they are. Yeah.